Our Father, we thank you that you have given us your word, which you call a lamp to our feet and a light to our path, that in it is found the wisdom of the ages. And thank you that through your word, you've given us really an owner's manual on how to be successful in raising kids, children that are a gift from you, and in impacting not just our own children, but other people's children, and even grandchildren that you might choose to give us. So we humbly bow tonight, and we ask you for your help, for your guidance and directions, that what we're covering would be instrumental in equipping us, and we ask it now in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we are trying to accomplish many objectives in this course. I'll just review them briefly. Um, I think oftentimes when people come to a course on parenting, they think that this is for young parents. It's really not because, in fact, many of the principles that we're going to study uh, that make us effective parents apply to any area of life. But still, we are going to hone in in these nine sessions together on some specific issues that are very critical to becoming an effective biblical parent. But it's not just for new parents. Uh, the youth of the church who are available should come to this, if at all possible. Uh, we have a lot of youth that don't have parents who go to this church. Uh, where are they going to learn? We have a lot of young Marines who have come to Christ in this church. Where are they going to learn about parenting? Uh, here, I hope. Where are they going to learn about if being an effective uh, dad or mom? Here, I hope. You're learning the principles, ideally, before you enter even into that chapter in your life. So we're trying to grasp this from God's perspective. We want God to renew our minds, and it's all part of the Great Commission to be able to teach the whole counsel of Scripture. That's what God has called us to, so that if someone comes up to you and they see you as an older man or an older woman in the body of Christ, and they ask you a question, you have a biblical responsibility to be able to respond to them. And if you don't know the answer, to be charged to get them an answer, to find out. But you don't want to just run at your mouth and give counsel that is far from being true. And many times, unfortunately, as pastors, we are undoing bad counsel that people in the body of Christ have given to people that's really not rooted and based in the Word of God. Now, last time we looked at Hannah, and the reason we opened the course with Hannah is because she lived in one of the darkest times in human history. She lived during the time of the judges, where twice over in that book it says every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, so to speak, did what was right in his own eyes. That's the essence of humanism, where I am the master of my fate. I determine what's right, what's wrong. Every person does what's right in his own eyes. And yet, in a very dark time in human history, Hannah was able to raise a godly man who became one of God's greatest prophets in the Old Testament, Samuel. We looked at four principles on our life. One, that you ought to begin to raise your children before they're conceived. In fact, I cited for you four examples of people who prayed for their children ever before they were born and how God raised up those children to be used mightily of Him. Uh, you may be praying that for someone else's child, maybe your own grandchildren. Secondly, the children that God blesses are to be seen as a gift from God. Any gift implies stewardship. And so they're not yours, they're the Lord's, they're called the gift of God, and you are training them as a good steward to let them go someday. I also tried to underscore that we are never to waver no matter how dark the circumstances may be. It was a dark day. And if you want to see what it looked like, just read the book of Judges or you can just read our own newspaper. It's not all that different. I mean, you talk about heinous evil in the day of the Judges. And we saw that even some of God's people, because of the hardness of heart, practice what the Bible never sanctions but records, polygamy. A polygamist in our day would not be considered a believer. You know, the Bible speaks about the qualifications for an elder, and it says he must be a one-woman man, and some wanting to skirt difficult issues like divorce and remarriage, and divorced people are not second-class citizens. What God has called clean, no one should call unclean. But approximately 60% of the churches in America 
have people who are on second marriages, and our church is no different because if you reach the culture, then you're going to reach the people who've been down that road. And yet, God wants to model the ideal. And so the husband of one wife is not a person who has one wife at a time and non-polygamist under, as some have really stretched it. Uh, it. Polygamy was illegal even in Rome when Paul wrote 1 Timothy. And it's illegal still in our nation, but I'm not sure for how much longer. In either case, even men like David was a polygamist. And we noted that he had four wives at least at one time, eight that are recorded in Scripture. And the Bible says, and many more. King David, a man after God's own heart, would not be considered a believer under the new covenant. But that's the blessing of the new covenant. And it should be an encouragement to us that God can take a heart of stone and then turn it into a heart of flesh where it's sensitive to the Lord. And then finally, we noted that a lot of the victories that we experience in parenting happens in the little everyday moments of life. And we'll be talking about those as we work through. Now, tonight, as you can see, this is handout number two, part one. And there'll be, I'm not sure, maybe three parts to it. We hope to underscore three, possibly four critical principles on how to become the right person and are in, in, in able to, that will enable you to parent correctly. Now, I know what a lot of parents want. They say, well, give me, you know, the five things I should teach my teenager. And, you know, what do I do on this and that? And those are all important things. But I'm telling you, they don't mean anything if we're not becoming the right kind of person. Those things will never really be lived out successfully unless we become the right kind of person. And so these first few sessions are really absolutely critical. So to become the right kind of person, number one, which is, we'll just look at one principle tonight, you must guard your minds. You must guard your minds. The battle, very simply, is won or lost in our minds. Now, as, America, as Americans, and really Westerners in general, we tend to see people as having two separate parts, where the heart refers to the seat of emotions and the intellect to the mind, where God sometimes uses them interchangeably. It is true that sometimes when you see the word mind in Scripture, namas, it can refer just to the mind. But very often it's far beyond that. It refers to the will, the the heart of things. And so, like anything else, context determines. But it's clear most of the time. Throughout his word, number two, God freely interchanges the words heart and mind to describe who we are such that the mind of a man reflects who he really is. Is that not what Proverbs 23, 7 underscores? There we are instructed, for as he, a person, thinks in his heart, so is he. Now bring that down to the realm of parenting. As you think in your heart, that's what you are, and that's potentially the kind of child you're going to raise. Um, Proverbs 23, 19 teaches us the principle that a man's heart reveals a man. That's the principle underscored in that verse, which is why God told Samuel that he examines the heart of a man and not his outward appearance. And Pastor Larry studied that with us recently. For the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Now, someone can learn the ins and outs of effective biblical parenting, and that's what most people come for in a parenting course. Give me 10 things that I should do to my teenagers, five that I should do to my little ones, and, you know, give me all the ins and outs, the rules, how do I discipline, etc. You can learn all that stuff. But if one fails to guard his heart and his mind, then it's all for nothing. Uh, listen to what Proverbs teaches us. Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. Put away from you a deceitful mouth, and put devious speech far from you. Let your eyes look directly ahead, and let your gaze be fixed straight in front of you. Watch the path of your feet, and all your ways will be established. You want your ways to be established in effective parenting? It comes down to the heart. 
Watch over your heart with all diligence because from it flow the very springs and the issues of life. Underscoring, number five, just how important our minds are in winning the spiritual battle, which we must win if, if we are to be successful in our parenting. Paul writes and instructs, writes and instructs the church into the city of Corinth with these words. This is from 2 Corinthians chapter 10. It says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. And is that not the principle that he underscores in his letter to the Ephesians? That our war is not against flesh and blood. It's not just against people, but it's against powers and principalities and evil forces that are at work in the heavenly realm. And so if our real war is not my neighbor, not my brother, not my sister, but it's evil forces that are at work, and we'll see how they interface with our own fallen nature and the world system around us. If that's true, then we need to approach the warfare that we're in from not a merely natural point of view. I want to tell you, Satan hates your kids. Satan, more than anything else, wants to ruin your family. He wants to destroy your children. He wants to wreck your testimony and show that Christianity has no value. So there's a real battle for the hearts and minds of your children. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare, and, and the word here for warfare, you think you hear the word war, right? It, it's a Greek word that doesn't refer to a skirmish, but to a, to a battle. It's translated elsewhere in, outside of the Bible, of a campaign, of a series of battles. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Now the Apostle Paul, number six, says here that our job in this battle is to destroy fortresses. Or some translations render this as strongholds. It means the same thing. As you turn the page, a stronghold, or you could say a fortress is a mental block, it's a mental block or it's a wrong way of thinking that results in a wrong way of behaving because the way of thinking is set up against the knowledge of God, all right? Strongholds can manifest themselves in bad habits or in bad attitudes or in bad parenting because strongholds or fortresses are based on the world's way of thinking that is set up against God's way of thinking. So I was overhearing a conversation and where I was at this particular meeting and this parent was uh, with her daughter and her daughter was talking about uh, the fact that she had gotten into medical school and and uh, she was going to put her baby in daycare now, and, but she was really excited. And this Christian was just congratulating her and drooling all over her. I would say that was a stronghold. I would say that that Christian who was drooling all over, not a single mother, but a mother who was going off to medical school and was going to give the responsibility of her children, not because she had to. Look, my hat is off to any woman that has to work to put food on the table. But that's not God's plan, as we're going to see. That's not His ideal. God's ideal, like in marriage, is one woman and one man until death separates us. People break the ideal. We have a ministry to single moms in our church family here, and we try to help them and support them, and they can't live out the ideal. They have to figure ways on how they are going to raise their children while at the same time try to raise a godly heritage and provide for their family. But God has an ideal, and the ideal is grossly diminished in our day. And most Christians are giving congratulations and a high five to actions that are actually contrary to the Word of God that are destructive to the family because they have a stronghold. They have a mental block. 
Now, they're not intentionally doing that very often, but they have a mental block of how they should think and what really are God's ways. Someone recently at a new members lunch, you know, told us, yeah, this people, she said, I didn't understand this. She said, because I told this person it never happened to me. They said two things. One is that uh, they asked her where she went to church. She said, Community Bible Church. And they said, oh, yeah, that's the church where you have to give your W-2s to the pastor to make sure that you're tithing. You know, whoever started that evil, fallen rumor, I have no idea. But someone will give an account for that careless word at the judgment seat. But they said, but that's the church, too, that encourages mothers to stay home. Yeah, we do. Is that a bad thing? Is that a bad thing for a mother to stay home and raise her children? What's wrong with that? It's a good thing. Now, we deal with broken people and broken families all the time. And people who have made financial decisions and they've made moral obligations where the mom has to work. But very often when they capture God's ideal and they begin to think after his thoughts, then they begin to take steps to see things change. So strongholds or fortresses are based on the world's way of thinking that is set up against God's way of thinking. Number nine, we often think of strongholds just in terms of sinful actions or attitudes, such as a worldview based on materialism or hedonism or sinful attitudes like worry, fear, guilt, bitterment, bitterness, or resentment. However, strongholds include every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, such, as, such that a false view of how we should parent or grandparent could be considered a stronghold. There's a lot of false views. I mean, think about it. There was a time in our culture prior to World War II when virtually every woman in America stayed home. Why did they do that? Because men were a bunch of male chauvinists and just thought that, you know, your place is in the home barefoot and pregnant. You know, I mean, that's how people diminish women sometimes. No, we didn't do it for that reason. We did it because our nation was strongly Christianized and people had a worldview that was influenced in an incredible way from the Bible. But as time went on, some, some of the children's children did that just because their parents did it, but without any biblical conviction. And when the Second World War came and uh, women were called to the factories to defend our nation, when it was all over, a lot of women decided to stay there and say, this is a place of significance. And very often what has to happen in our day because the world says that to stay home and to raise your children is meaningless. I mean, my daughter was a residential mentor at Clemson University. And I remember she was in this group of about 80 residential mentors who were being trained. And, and they were having this dialogue and this discussion over what is significant for young ladies when they graduate from that university. And she mentioned that she was getting a degree in childhood education and, and that if God uh, though allowed her to have a husband someday and to have children, she'd like to stay home and raise those children. You talk about people coming unglued. You talk about people having a fit about how old-fashioned and antiquated that way of thinking is. Now, as I say that, some of you are thinking, oh, where's this pastor coming from? Because you may have a stronghold where you've not really thought through what the Word of God says. Does God really mean when He says a woman should be a worker at home? That she, it doesn't mean that you can't make money from your home. But what is the primary role of a mom? So every false view needs to be torn down so that we can take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. In this course, number 11, we will focus on tearing down these fortresses by replacing our false way of thinking with the truth of God's Word. Verse, um, 
Uh, Paul states here at the end of verse 5 that he, along with the other apostles, had learned to apply this principle such that they were able to say, we, meaning Paul and the other apostles, are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So it is a principle that you can live out. God never calls you to do something that's impossible. He will enable you to do and complete His will. Now, there's a progressive dimension to God's will. And so the new believer who's been saved three months, who's just learning the Bible for the first time, and an older believer who's been saved for three years, is farther along in terms of taking every thought captive because he or she has had potentially more time to renew the mind. Uh, number 13, the original Greek literally reads, we are leading captive every thought. Where the words, we are leading captive. That's how it reads, actually, the word order in the Greek. Which may seem a little awkward in English, but the word, we are leading captive, is one word in Greek. And it means to control, to conquer, to bring into submission. And so... The challenge is, how do I make my mind mind, right? Is that not the challenge? How do I make my mind mind? Because by nature, my mind does not want to mind, but will often go in a different direction. That's what it wants to do. When we should be thinking a certain way, our minds sometimes want to go another way, or simply said, when I need to ponder, it wants to wander. You've heard that expression before, right? The Apostle Paul describes this dilemma in Romans chapter 7. For the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very thing that I do not want. But if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it. But sin which dwells in me, I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God and the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. So Paul describes this warfare that only a believer can have. This is not someone in an unregenerate state. When you're born again, you still have your old fallen nature, but you have a new capacity, a new ability. So Paul says, walk by the Spirit that you might not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh, the sinful nature, is in opposition to the Spirit. They wage war against one another, he argues, that you might not do the things that you please. And so there's this internal conflict. The good that I wish I cannot do, I do the very thing I don't wish to do. And so a part of growing in Christ is we're learning how to bring our fallen nature under the control of God that we can walk and obey His will more and more. It's the process of sanctification. It doesn't happen all at once. It's a lifelong process. Number 17, effective biblical parenting begins with becoming the right kind of person, which among other principles principles is a battle of the mind. It really is. It is a battle of the mind. Okay, point B there on your outline. Guarding your heart involves what you keep from it. When we talk about watch over, guard your heart, garrison your heart with all diligence because from it flows the issues of life, first it involves what you keep from it. So in order to make our minds to be God's mind, we must be careful what we put into our minds, right? A lot depends on what we put into it. Of course, Satan attack, uh, Satan's attacks on our minds overlaps with his attack, or his attacks, plural, on our eyes and ears. Why? Because it is through the eyes and ears that input is given to the mind. Is that not what Jesus taught like in Mark 9, 47? If your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. He was, he was talking, if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. Or the foot in another passage. He didn't literally mean to pluck out your eye or cut off your hand or cut off your foot. But his point was is that there has to be a war against sin if we're going to be successful in the battle. There has to be a line drawn in the sand where you are going to choose. And you see, a lot of Christians really don't want to draw that line. They want to compromise. 
in terms of their eyes and their ears, especially in the culture in which we live. Jesus says it. I didn't put it on here, but it's in Mark 4, 24. Take care of what you listen to. So what you put in your eyes, what you listen to, is very important to the Lord. Three, so when we speak about guarding the mind, we are first and foremost speaking about guarding our eyes and ears. Unless you are a wicked person, I'm sure that you would never invite someone over to your living room to commit adultery in front of you, would you? Are you kidding, Pastor? Someone into my living room to commit adultery in front of me and my family? And yet, so many of God's people have so compromised their minds that they are doing that very thing by what they watch on television or the, we could add to the list, obviously. Some of God's people, by their lifestyles, are saying that they can allow anything into their minds and that they will be just fine and will be successful parents or grandparents as long as they protect the children. That's the argument. Well, I wouldn't let my kids watch that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't allow my grandkids in the room when we're watching that. And they think that somehow they can live this double life, that it's okay for them to soak up sin, and it's not okay for their kids, and they can be an effective parent. Nothing could be further from the truth. They have been, number seven, deceived by the evil one. For God's word plainly says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. Take King David. While King David failed miserably on one occasion by compromising his eyes and therefore his mind. You know the story, 2 Samuel 11 and 12, the story of Bathsheba, right? The pattern of his life, the pattern of his life was as such that the Spirit of God could inspire a man after God's own heart to write these words. I set no worthless thing before my eyes. Wait a minute, David, you didn't do that when you store and stared and lusted after Bathsheba. But the pattern of his life, he may have lost an occasional battle, but the pattern of his life, as a man after God's own heart, he could say, I will set no worthless thing before my eyes. As parents, if we let down our guards in this area, our hearts will be less sensitive to the Spirit of God, and we will allow our children, both by our example and our lack of discernment, to compromise their eyes and ears. This is how it works. I can tell you it works this way. You got some dad who's going on the internet and he's viewing porn, or some mom who's watching garbage on the television at night, the kids aren't here. Nobody knows it. And what they are doing is they are suffocating the Spirit of God within them. They are polluting their mind. They are losing their ability to discern good and evil that may be walking right in the front door of their homes. Oh, but they're going through all the steps. We bring them to church and Awana and da 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 da. But they're losing their kids. Because of what they've let in their minds. Remember what the writer to the Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 5. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, and we've talked a lot about that before, that there's the gift of teaching which you can't control. God gives spiritual gifts as he wills. There's the office of teaching such that James will say, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that you'll incur a stricter judgment. But then there is a responsibility to teach. It's part of the Great Commission. We all have it. For though by this time you, and it's not you singular, you plural, y'all, ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the ABCs, the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness. For he is an infant. So milk is used in a couple of different ways in Scripture. Sometimes it's used of the simplistic truths of God's word. 
And sometimes it's used of the purity of God's word. Like Peter is not speaking of simplistic truth, but he's saying like newborn babes, long for the pure milk of the word that you may grow. That's the purity of God's word. But sometimes it's used in deference to more complicated truths. And so he said these people had regressed. But solid food is for mature. Notice, who because of practice, that's lifestyle. There's no perfect people here, myself included. No perfect people. But we're talking about pattern here. We're talking about what is my practice. Who by practice have their senses trained. You see that word trained? It's the Greek word gymnazo. We get our word ultimately into Latin and then to English gymnasium. They've gymnased, gymnasticized their senses to discern good and evil. And you know what we lack today in the body of Christ? Discernment. People don't know the difference between good and evil. I remember being in an airport and Jeremy, my oldest son, was crawling around near the window and down underneath, I think it was some kind of, I don't know what it was, but he reached down underneath the little ledge there where the window is. You watch the planes and he picked up a roach and it was going right into his mouth. <laughs> and I grabbed it. He didn't know the difference. But some of us were putting roaches in our mouths. And some of us don't see that. We don't really see it because we've been so polluted by the world. Number 10, guarding the mind is inextricably linked to our ability to discern good and evil, which is essential if we are to guard our homes from the evil one. That's what we need. We need a dad, especially as the family shepherd and the mom who comes alongside who's guarding the home. Guarding the mind is inextricably linked to, the, to our ability to see the Spirit bring Scripture to the everyday events of life in order to bring our children up on the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Why is that? You see, sometimes we think, and I am not against this, so please don't misunderstand me. We're a parent at the end of the day. We did it with our kids for years and years and years. Some nights we didn't do it because we were off in some event and whatever. And, but we would sit down and we'd have a Bible study. We'd talk about it and we'll talk about some of the specifics and how-tos. But that's about, I'd say, 20% of the instruction that you will give. 80% of the instruction that you will give as a parent that will change your child's life is in the everyday moments of life. As you walk in the way, as you lie down, as you rise up, as Deuteronomy 6 teaches. And your ability to take whatever God is showing you, which he shows you in a clean heart or a clean mind. Remember, they're used interchangeably. Where he then, in that moment of life, brings it to the forefront of your thinking. That's linked through guarding your mind. And that's where a lot of your teaching takes place. Where you see this situation that you're in and you're able to relate God's truth to that situation. C, guarding your mind also involves what you place in it, what you keep out of it, but also what you put in it, right? The old cliche, C-L-I-C-H-E, where's Drew? You hear Drew somewhere? Raise your hand, Drew. Yeah. What's the accent? Grob, accent grob, right? Isn't it that way? Yeah, <laughs> all right. Over the E, it goes this way, all right. The old cliche from the early days of the computer, guy go, garbage in, garbage out, is still true today. If you put bad data into a computer, you will get bad results out. If you put mental garbage into your mind, you will get garbage out in your life. So we are exhorted in Proverbs 15, 14, that the mind of the intelligent seeks knowledge, but the mouth of fools feeds on folly or trash. The Hebrew word translated intelligent does not simply speak of IQ when it says the mind of the intelligent seeks knowledge, but the mouth of fools feeds on folly. And the word folly is sometimes used in the Hebrew Bible of garbage. Hmm. It doesn't simply mean IQ. 
what we might call true intelligence, but it, what it does mean is what we might call true intelligence or discernment. The um, HCSB uh, renders it, a discerning mind seeks knowledge, but the mouth of fools feeds on foolishness. Uh, the Net Bible puts it, the discerning heart seeks knowledge, but the mouth of fools feeds on folly. Any nutritionist will tell you that there are three kinds of food for your physical body. There is brain food that makes you smarter or maybe sharper. I don't know the best word. You know what brain food is, right? What are some of the brain foods? Yeah, dark chocolate. That's one of my favorite. Not milk chocolate, dark chocolate. They say that's a brain food. Turmeric. Now, my son, Grant, he said, Dad, you need to take turmeric. I said, really? Yeah, he said, you take a couple teaspoons of turmeric, and you mix it in with about a half a cup of apple vinegar cider, and you drink it down. I'm like, oh, you know, I did that for about two weeks, and I started breaking out in this rash all over my body. But it's called a brain food for what it's worth. Kale, all the berries, strawberries, blueberries, raspberries, blackberries, you know, sweet potatoes. Those are your brain foods, right, that supposedly make you smarter or sharper. And then there's junk food which just adds calories. Uh, you know, we go sometimes, my wife and I, she loves Taco Bell. And so we'll go to Taco Bell, and there's this one fill-up meal they have where they give you these little things that are like, I don't know, they're puffs of air, and they have cinnamon on it, but you eat them, and there's like even no taste to it. And there, it's just like you're chewing on air. I would call that junk food. They just add calories. There's not even a good taste value to it. And then there's what we might call toxic foods, which are poison. The same is true in the spiritual realm in terms of what you hear and what you allow into your mind by what you see, which is why Jesus warns, so take care how you listen. Some food is, some, <clears throat> some, brain, some food is brain food that will make you smarter spiritually and when applied, godlier and more mature emotionally. Some of us, if people summarize our lives, they'd say, well, he's just an emotional wreck. He's all over the map. He's high maintenance. She's high maintenance. Man, they're just, you don't know where they're going to be from day to day. And they never mature emotionally. They have a junk diet in the mind, I can tell you that. And if they don't change and move forward... There's a reason for that. It just doesn't happen that way. Well, I'm locked in emotional trauma my whole life until I go to the grave. That's the psychobabble of our day. God is in the business of changing lives. But there's a means by which he does that. Then there's junk food that is neither good or bad, but it's just like filling your mind with unneeded calories. Paul kind of hits on this principle in 1 Corinthians 6, 12. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Nothing wrong with watching, say, a football game, right, if you like football. But I know dads, when football season comes, and that's all they do. And some of their boys and girls in the home who need some of their attention when they're home on the weekend, all they are is sitting there in front of a television set. Some things are okay. But if you're mastered by those things, then it's not beneficial. In other words, number nine, some things are not, aren't necessarily wrong, but neither are they necessary. And that they do not really help me. Again, all things are helpful for me, but not all things are helpful, as the ESV puts it. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. That's another way to express the same thought. Throughout the Scriptures, God admonishes us to fill our mind with the right things. Uh, you know, I'm proud of you parents who bring your kids here, and I wish more of you who are live streaming, if you could somehow... We had about 100 families live streaming. I don't know how many were on Facebook last Wednesday. But when these kids are back here, they're learning music. You know, think about the Jewish people. If you lived, say, in Nazareth or Bethlehem or any small town in Israel, you didn't have your own Bible. 
So where did you learn the Scripture? You had to go to the synagogue. And in the synagogue, you learned the Scripture. How did you hide God's Word in your heart? Well, you'd have to go there and you'd try to memorize it. And it's very interesting to me that in the New Testament, the Psalms are quoted over and over and over and over and over again. More than all the other Old Testament books. Why is that? Because that's what they sang. You know, I could ask you guys, uh, um, I could start singing a song and some of you could just, you could go right through it. Because there's something about a song that's the power of music. Remember, the whole book of Psalms was sung. They sang the Psalms. And it was a powerful tool. And when you've got your kids back there singing godly music, it's a powerful tool. You can't get that via live stream. And not only do they sing godly songs back there. My wife's been working back there for 25 years with those kids. And some of you have spouses out there. They also memorize Scripture. Psalm 1, Psalm 8, Psalm 100. Here is Psalm 1. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. They act it out back there. They have all the motions and everything. So cool to watch the kids. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in it he meditates day and night. He'll be like a tree family, firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and it does not wither. And whatever he does, he prospers. If, number 11, you want to be healthy and successful as a parent in your ability to raise a godly heritage, then you must fix your mind on the right things. Look, I meet parents who start late. We've had parents who've come to Christ and their kids are in college or they're in high school and their kids are just ingrained in the world. That's okay. God will meet you where you're at. There's adults here who God brought from other parts of the country. And I always find it interesting, especially God, God bringing people from the sections of the country where the gospel is not being preached. And he brings them to this region. And, you know, we see a lot of people in their 60s and 70s come to Christ. Because God loves those people and preserved those people. And knew they were in a town or a community where the churches were liberal and the gospel wasn't preached and they, they were born again. And they, they look back and they have these regrets. You can't unscramble eggs. But you can go forward and you can stand in the gap and intercede for those kids. And you just watch what God can do. You might not, some of you, see it until... You get to heaven. Some prayers are answered at funerals. I remember doing a funeral some years ago. And this mother over and over and over again pleaded for her child's conversion. And then there I was doing her funeral. And at her funeral, that adult man came to Christ. So you just never know. If you are characterized, number 12, by placing mental garbage into your mind... All you will get will be garbage out of your life. Every Christian is locked in a constant, intense war with demonic forces. It's true. See, that sounds bizarre. It's true. The enemy is the evil one and his demonic forces. That's what Paul was hammering over to the Ephesians. You've got these Jewish people and these Gentile people who aren't getting along with one another. And Paul says, your enemy is not the Jew or the Gentile. It's not flesh and blood. It's demonic forces. He's waging war. He's putting vain imaginations. Some of you, you're having trouble living with your husband or your wife. And there's these vain imaginations. They're fiery darts. Where do you think they come from? They come from the evil one because he wants to wreck your family. And we will see that one dimension to raising healthy kids is ideally to have a healthy marriage. Now look, some parents have to do it all alone. And that's okay. You might not be able to change your spouse, but there's one person for sure that you can deal with, and that's your own heart. 14, many of us have become so intent on fighting the external battles that we forget that much of the conflicts we face are not external forces, 
but with our own mind and thoughts. How true. Listen to what James says. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. The word carried away is a Greek word that literally means to bait a hook or to bait a trap. And so what are you trying to do with the fish? Well, if you're a good fisherman, and I'm not, then you, you, you know how to bait the hook in such a way to entice that fish to bite on the hook. If you're a good trapper, you're enticing that animal to walk into the trap. That's what the evil one is doing. He is offering us pleasure. He says each one is tempted when he is carried away or enticed by his own lusts. By his own lust. Now, the word lust is, can be a neutral word in the Bible. We think of the word lust and it just means sexual lust. Actually, there's many kinds of lusts in the Bible. Eating is normal, but gluttony is lust. Sleep is normal, but laziness is lust. Marriage, the marriage bed is honorable, but when it's defiled, it's become lust. It just means a strong desire. And sometimes it's used very positively in Scripture. You know, later on in the book of James, the fourth chapter, he talks about how the Spirit strongly desires. It's the word, same word. This is the noun form of the word, epithumia. That's the verb form of the word. Same word, though. The Spirit lusts after, God lusts after the Spirit who is in you. He has a strong desire for Him to be able to dominate our lives. Then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. See, what we don't see is we see the bait. And we see the pleasure the bait brings. Does your flesh enjoy watching a sensual program or one filled with violence? You better believe it. That's what it enjoys. There's pleasure in sin for a season. But what we don't see is what happens when the trap falls on us, when we've bit into the hook. David saw Bathsheba bathing. What he didn't see was his dead baby. What he didn't see was the murdered husband. What he didn't see was the other soldiers who died. What he didn't see was the violation of his daughter Tamar later on by his son Absalom. He let his guard down and evil walked in the front door. Sin always begins where a thought is conceived is when we adopt a false value. This will lead to a sinful action being carried out. The first line of defense in becoming the right person in order to be able to raise the right kind of person starts in the mind by taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. For this to be real in our lives, we must have a bulldog tenacity for having truth in a heart that is guarded from evil. You know, you won't be hungry if your heart is not guarded, you won't be hungry for the Word of God. That happens in a clean heart. I remember reading, I don't know, four or five years ago, some kid in Iowa, he was like 12 years old, and he got some kind of virus. And you can probably find it on the Internet if you do tell me. And uh, I think he was in Iowa. And um, he came out of the hospital, and he lost his appetite. He had no appetite to eat or to drink. The kid went like from 130 pounds to 70 pounds, and they weren't able to figure it out. Maybe they figured it out for the kid. You know, sometimes I hear a news story, and I just pray for the kid, you know. Lord, help that little boy. Maybe he's been healed. I don't know. But he had no appetite. Can you imagine that? No appetite. So you have to kind of tell your mind, I got to eat. Now, there are certain desires that God put in us that are healthy. You get hungry, so you need to eat. And you need to do that. There's a lot of natural desires that are God-ordained. They become lusts and fallen desires when they go outside of God's will. Well, it's when your heart is clean through a guarded mind that you have a hunger for the Word of God, and it's in that guarded, clean mind that the Spirit of God then and only then has freedom in the everyday moments of life to take the truth of Scripture and relate it to whatever you might find yourself in. So the principles we're going to look at 
on being an effective dad or mom really are meaningless if our hearts aren't right with the Lord. And we're living in a depraved, evil culture. And some of the kids here who are 16 and 17-year-olds have absolutely no idea where we've come from. Primetime TV when I was a kid because I could only watch TV on Friday and Saturday nights. Those are the rules in my dad's home. Unless there was some special family time, Sunday night we might watch Bonanza. But Friday night, it was the Flintstones, and it was uh, uh, the Andy Griffith show, and, you know, all this stuff that was just clean, good stuff. That doesn't sell in a depraved culture. And it's everywhere. And so, for you as a dad or a mom to raise that right kind of kid, they can't see a double standard. They have to see that you mean business. And then you will be able to lead them accordingly. Those who are going to pray, make your way down here. And Pastor Vince will close us as we pray for the missions conference. Our Father, we thank you tonight for the opportunity to bow our minds and our hearts. Search me, O God. See if there be any evil way in me. Lead me in the way everlasting. We pray with King David. Thank you that you are in the business of changing lives. Thank you that you meet us wherever we are at. May it not be said of us that our children are rebels because we were rebels. We know, Father, in the end they have their own choices to make. But may you use us as parents, as grandparents, as those giving counsel to other families who are in that process in their lives May you use us in a way that would bring honor to your Son. May we minister out of a clean heart because we've guarded what we put through the window of our eyes and through our ears. In Jesus' name we pray.